Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and distinguished guests. I'm Yunji Kim, today's MC, and a student here at Korea University. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Welcome to the ARC Conference 2019 for multi-scale resilience practices. First, allow me to introduce Ojong Echo Resilience Institute and a Asia Resilience Center. Ojong Echo Resilience Institute, also known as OJRI, was established in 2014 by donation of Dr. Nam Kyu Min, and it focuses on ecosystem resilience and sustainable development. Asia Resilience Center was established in 2017 as one of the OJRI's activities, and the center has since been affiliated to the OJRI. ARC is a scientific opinion board with a bottom-up approach to long-term sustainable social ecological systems in Asia. Beyond Asia, the ARC serves as a bridge between resilience research institutes from a national scale to an international scale. Last year, the very first ARC conference was held here in Korea University, and today I'm glad to announce that we'll hold our second ARC conference for multi-scale resilience practices. On behalf of the OJD, Professor Woo Kyun Lee, the director of OJD and the chair of the ARC Conference 2019, will declare the opening of the, of the year's ceremony. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Woo Kyun Lee with a big round of applause. <clears throat> Honorable Professor Jin Tech Jung the President of Korea University, Honorable Board of Director of AIC Conference 2019, Professor Ming Wong Wong, Education University of Hong Kong, Professor Yo An Son, Korea University. This both professor is a co-director of AIC Conference. Professor Nanti Bolan, the University of uh, Newcastle, Professor Chao Sheng Chang from uh, National University of Galloway, Professor Brian John Wright, University of East Angelia. Honorable plenary speakers, Professor Joran Bojnovic from IHG Delft, Professor, uh, Dr. Kraxner, Florian Kraxner, one of my best friends from EASA, <laughs> and Dr. Jong-An Jung from APCC. And honorable Professor Kyu Hyuk Kim, Dean of College of Life Science and Biotechnology, and Professor Jung Kyu Kim, uh, former director of OJD. Participants, guests, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the organizing committee of AIC Conference 2019 and Ojong Eco Resilience Institute, OJD, of Korea University, I'm honored to officially declare the opening of the second AIC conference 2019 here in Korea University. I'm happily welcome all of the participants and guests to the conference and I hope you are all comfortable. Our OJD was founded in uh, 20, uh, 2014 and affiliated to Korea University with the generous donation of Dr. Namgyu Min, Namgyu Min. His passionate goal is for OJRI to become a world-class institute for leading research, education, and training in the field of ecological and social resilience. Through OJRI establishment, we are envisioned to engage in national and international academic growth, breeding of ideas, knowledge for nurturing a more resilient world. Today, at this distinguished gathering and on behalf of OJD and AIC members, I am privileged to convey our utmost gratitude to our founder, Dr. Nam Gyo Min. To put our mission into action, OJRI currently hosts several international organizations, including Asia Resilience Center, Middle Latitude Region Network, Sustainable Development, Development Solution Network Korea Office, 
global carbon project, etc. Ujiri will provide logistical and financial support for these front runner to conduct top notch researches and education in the field of resilience internationally. These days, we have been experiencing uncertainties, imbalances in a changing world and strong ask to secure our global society for future as well as current generation. You are asked to take a new way of thinking and acting for better decision making in solving our facing challenges and problems such as climate change, biodiversity loss, international disaster, regional conflicts, and air, uh, environmental pollution, etc. The science and technology usually contributes to solving our facing problems and ensure sustainable development of our global society. But science and technology sometimes threaten our identity and dignity of, of our humankind when they are used just for selfish interest of our of specific groups. In this connection, we must, we must fool our knowledge and ex expertise and resources to crush these self-interest groups and harness science and technology to turn our facing challenges into opportunities. The ability to share our knowledge and technology based on resilient thinking will lead us to achieve sustainable development of our global society. We are now in a university. The intergenerational sharing of our experience will be also very important for our common future. We are in the same place here in Korea University together for sharing our time experienced, experienced by our individuals. I hope ARC conference can be a space where resilient thinking are pursued together through sharing our knowledge and experience. Personally, I recognize one way for resilient thinking these days. I thought always time close to ourselves is not flowing and no longer alive. But space where time shared will be rather alive. Please actively share your precious knowledge and experience with your beloved participants here, here in AIC Conference 2019. It will be a way of for uh, regional thinking. Finally, I would like to commend our commend the organizing committee of AIC Conference 2019 and OJD Steps for working hard to make his conference happen. I would also once again thank Honorable Professor Jin Tech Chung, the president of Korea University, for blessing this conference with his presence here and sharing his wisdom. To end, I wish all participants a very fruitful conference and enjoyable your space and time here in Korea University and so. Thank you all. Thank you, Professor Ogin Lee. Please give him another round of applause, please. <laughs> Next, I would like to invite the president of Korea University, Professor Chin Tech Chang, to give a welcoming remark. Ladies and gentlemen, please give him a big round of applause. Distinguished guest speakers, presenters, invited guests, and ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Korea University, it is my great pleasure to warmly welcome you all to the Asia Resilience Center, ARC Conference 2019. Human being has lived on our beautiful planet for a long time, sometimes in, usually in good partnership, 
but sometimes in conflict with each other. While the world achieved prosperity through um, ceaseless development, we do experience severe global risk, as well as local and regional conflicts at times. Global risks such as climate change, environmental degradation, urbanization, poverty, and rapid aging population cannot be dealt with individual efforts alone. They must be mitigated and resolved through joint global efforts. For example, the Paris Accords, Paris Accord was finally concluded in December 2015, in which con countries agreed to commit to le lessening the contributing factors to climate change like greenhouse gas emissions. During the same year, members of the United Nations agreed to pursue the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, which are the blueprint to achieve a better and most sustainable future for all. Resolving global issues together requires us to develop a new paradigm. Resilience can be considered a new pathway to sustainable development. It is the capacity of a social ecological system to withstand uh, disturbances and other stress factors and develop a system with a well-functioning structure. A resilient society can be achieved by combining experimental knowledge with other fields and building a multi-scale network together. The Asia Resilience Center, ARC, which was the first founded in 2017 and affiliated to the Ojung Eco Resilience Institute, OJERI, which is an uh, intellectual hub dedicated to address such challenging missions and to enhance the capacity of social ecological resilience. OJERI, which was founded in 2014, and ARC together can play uh, people, people to our uh, roles for achieving such a resilience and sustainable society. I would like to take this opportunity to express my most heartful appreciation to Dr. Min Nam Gyu, who is paving the way for the better world through his honorable and generous donation to the Ojong Eco Resilience Institute. <coughs> As the present Korean University, which was founded in 2005, 1905, which has led Korean society ever since, I have strongly advocated human KU, creating new value. Korea University is striving to force the creative talent to contribute to the better world. A better world could be thought of as a resilient society, and creative talent could be cultivated throughout resilient thinking. Technology should be developed and utilized to help resolving the mega problems the world con currently faces and contribute to create new value added for future and human beings. The social problems we face can be overcome by clearly recognizing them, possessing prosperitarial uh, technology and strong capabilities and cooperating to resolve the problems through sharing um, uh, the partnership. Hopefully, resilient thinking and society can extend beyond Korea and Asia. It is my sincere wish that second ARC conference will serve as a launching pad for a solid partnership for peace and prosperity of people and planet. I thank you all for being here and engaging in such an important discussion today. Special thanks to goes to the organizing committee of ARC Conference 2019. For your dedicated dedication and hard work to put this conference together and make this event possible. To all of our dear de guests and uh, delegates, I wish you all the enjoyable and fruitful time here at Korea and Korea University. Thank you very much. Thank you for your sincere remark. Now I would like to invite Professor Min Hong Wong, the co-director of ARC Conference 2019 and a professor at the Education University of Hong Kong to give a congratulatory remark. 
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Min Hong Wong with a big hand. Good morning. Professor Zhong, Professor Lee, I think this is indeed my honor and pleasure to give this congratulatory remark. Um, I, I was so honored last, uh, well, two years ago, I, I was named a co-director of this ARC. And I'm really glad that this ARC conference has become a conference series. Uh, I'm, I'm very glad to see all our new friends and meeting uh, uh, some new friends. So hopefully we will interact a bit more during the conference. Um, now, as an international center of excellence for resilience and sustainability science, I firmly believe that the ARC would have a major role to play, um, especially in compacting problems which are commonly encountered by Asian countries, uh, which have been developed rapidly past 20, 30 years, rapid socioeconomic change, uh, urbanization and industrialization and so on. Now to give you some good examples, uh, transboundary movement of electronic waste uh, would be one, where these electronic waste are uh, moving to less developed countries and generation uh, of all these toxic chemicals through rather primitive techniques are imposing quite a bit of ecological and environmental health. Um, the second example would be the overuse and abuse of plastics. All these plastics, microplastics, together with the chemicals associated with plastics, like um, bisphenol A, which is a constituent of plastics, and also phthalates, which are additives of the plastics, and they are endocrine disruptors. In addition, these microplastics would also absorb a lot of potential toxic chemicals. So the long-term effects of these plastics and microplastics uh, on imposing adverse effects on the environment and also uh, human health are not yet known. So we, have, we, we should have a lot of work to do. Um, so there's a, an urgent need for the ARC to initiate some joint projects with some Asian countries. Uh, so eventually we will play a bit uh, more important role in uh, solving some of these problems. Now the major theme of uh, to, uh, this year's conference would be multi-scale multi resilience practices and we have lined up very compact program uh, for the two days and then I sincerely hope you will all enjoy the program and um, in addition, if you have time, you have a bit of sightseeing of Seoul, which is one of my favorite cities on earth. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Min Hong Wong. Um, before we end this ceremony, um, I would like to make a few announcements. Um, your lunch will be served on campus after the plenary session at 1220. Please follow the staff for direction. Um, the committees of OJD and ARC invited speakers and professors. Please make your way out to the lobby for a group photo in a minute. With this, the opening ceremony will be concluded. Thank you very much for being here. Start the of ARC 2019. We are a little bit behind on schedule, so we're going to start right away. Let me introduce five plenary speakers today. The first speaker is going to be Ming Hong Wang. Let me introduce briefly about him. Professor Wang is currently an advisor and research chair professor of environmental science at the Education University of Hong Kong. 
And he is also a distinguished visiting professor of School of Environmental Science and Engineering at Southern University of Science and Technology, Shenzhen, China. He is a highly cited, uh, highly cited researcher at environmental science field of the study, and currently he ranked 24 in worldwide. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen please welcome Dr. Ming Hong Wang. What, what I would like to do uh, is to give you some overview about the transboundary movement of electronic waste, uh, starting from, say, 2000, uh, year 2000 and then up to now. Um, I have problems. Okay. So um, I will give you, I would like to give you some background about what electronic waste, I, I'm sure you know what, what the definition, and then the techniques people use to recycle uh, some primitive techniques. Now, um, I'll give you some information about China now tighten up the border. Uh, you, you see, electronic waste used to go from various countries to Hong Kong first, because Hong Kong as a free port, and then all this electronic waste would be smuggled through the border, end up in some mega recycling sites like Guai Yu and Tai Zhao. Um, and then I will go on to talk a bit about Hong Kong. Now, my, the talk of my, uh, the contents of my talk will largely based on two articles recently came out, uh, one in Nature Sustainability, and another one in reviews, critical reviews of EST. Um, I'm sure everybody agree, toxic chemicals seem to be a worldwide concern. Now this is a project I, I took part quite some time ago now, uh, a, bit, a bit outdated. Um, this is mainly to deal with the emerging chemicals management issue in developing countries and countries with economies in transition. So uh, this is a summary table, and um, if, you can, if you have good eyesight, you can see the ranking of this. Uh, and then heavy metals stood out as the most urgent uh, chemicals. We need to um, pay more attention. Um, now, categories of electronic waste, there would be a lot of household appliances, all this IT, telecoms, equipment, uh, ele electrical, electronic tools, and, and so on, toys, and so, and so on. So e-waste e has uh, become a problem because rapid technological changes, increase of the purchase, uh, and then more electronic waste is generated. And then um, these electronic waste in, in some countries, they are disposed of in landfills. Um, and then affecting human health. Um, how much is e-waste is there? Unfortunately, there seems to be a rapid increase uh, the past 10 or 20 years, if you look at the, uh, the data. And then China produced a large amount, about 8.5 million tons domestically, and it is estimated it will catching up uh, the US in a few years' time. Um, so, so far, um, because of the tightened control of the electronic waste of China, so these electronic waste are now stored in Hong Kong, uh, quite a bit of them. So imposing problems because they are on our backs, uh, backyard now, and then finding the way to go to other countries. Um, I just want to cite an example. I'm, I'm sure Nancy will, will be very familiar with this. This is a project I, I took part with uh, um, Ravi Naidu, a PhD student from Korea, uh, not Korea, I'm sorry, from Thailand. Uh, he's now head of a department in Hat Yai. This is update information, Nancy, and, he's, and she's doing very good. Uh, at that time, she was looking at the leachate, uh, which contain all these heavy metals and, um, and, and organic pollutants, G 
generating from this electronic waste disposed of in the landfill. Um, now, this is a map showing you the original routes of electronic waste. So a lot of these wastes are coming from the states and then other sort of more uh, well-developed countries uh, in, into Asian countries in, in, in China at that time and also other uh, relevant countries. Um, fortunately, the e-waste regulation are become, becoming tighter and tighter since 1990, 2001, 2012, and then recently issuing some catalogs of soils waste forbidden to, to be imported uh, in China and also different types of solid waste, uh, I including plastics. So now we have problems in dealing with all these waste products from uh, in other countries, in receiving countries. Um, now the, the, this is the more recent uh, map, 2016, 2017. So all these, some of these electronic waste are diverted to other countries, and unfortunately, taking advantage of their less stringent regulatory, uh, 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 their less stringent regulations and also, uh, also cheaper manpower. So accumulation of China, uh, of e-waste in China, this is a general view, so you can see uh, there seems to be quite a bit of uh, electronic waste generated domestically in China. Um, now, going back to these mega sites for recycling electronic waste, I'm going to show you the detrimental effects of these primitive techniques in recycling e-waste. Um, there, there are two sites we have been working on. One, the red one, uh, is Guai Yu, which is in Guangdong province, and then the pink one, pink one, uh, well, it doesn't look like pink here, yellow, yellow. Yellow one is uh, Tai Zhao, which is in the middle of Zhejiang province, and then the green one, we are trying to use it as a control site. So there has been a changing role for Hong Kong in global illegal e-waste shipment because of all this um, uh, regulation set up by, by China. Uh, and now after 2012, we have quite a bit of problems um, in dealing with the electronic waste coming into Hong Kong. Bearing in mind, Hong Kong is very small with seven and a half million of people. So uh, we have more and more electronic waste stored in Hong Kong and then not long ago, I think two years ago, the ba Basel Action Network, a watchdog for the United Nations Basel Convention, they spent two years in investigating the problem, tracking down the pathways of this electronic waste by, by uh, having this, uh, uh, this electronic waste tagged with some device and then eventually found out they end up in, in Hong Kong. So we have problem, if you look at the map of Hong Kong, really very small. The northern part is Sanjun. Uh, now every week I travel through Hong Kong to Sanjun. So I work at the Education University of Hong Kong and also the Southern University of Science and Technology. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad to see, to meet somebody from engineering school uh, this morning, uh, and he's from Korea. Um, so we have some sensitive uh, regions in Hong Kong, and then the uh, northwest part is the Ramsar site, where we have a lot of biological organisms. And we seem to have a bit of farmlands and also fish ponds around that area. So imagine these uh, Toxic chemicals would be emitted uh, through the storage. Even storage, you will emit toxic chemicals and also uh, recycling. 
So we have two projects uh, some time ago trying to look at the soil contamination and protection guidelines in Hong Kong and also the management of e-waste in Hong Kong. Uh, so the, I'll skip this, uh, if you look at the potential uh, PTS, persistent toxic substances, generated from the electronic waste, and you will see a wide range of toxic chemicals. The TV plastic casing uh, containing flame retardant PPDE, the cathode ray tube containing lead, screen display, mercury, cables full of uh, PVC, and, and so on. Uh, now, if you, uh, if you are familiar with the Stockholm Convention on POPs, there are some uh, requirements for putting these chemicals into control. Uh, so so um, the, the, the chemicals are very persistent in the environment. They will cause a lot of uh, health effects. And also through bioaccumulation and biomagnification, the toxic chemicals will become extremely high in top carnivores. Uh, and that would be long distance travel. And a lot of these chemicals are uh, generated from electronic waste, uh, could be classified as these uh, toxic chemicals. So there would be uh, environmental and health impacts uh, of this uncontrolled recycling of e-waste. Um, when we talk about e-waste recycling in these uh, areas, they tend to use a menu separation of the products, the soldering of printed circuit boards. You try to heat the circuit boards on top of an open fire. So obviously, when you heat um, something containing plastics, you tend to generate um, dioxin into the air. And um, they, they try to extract precious metals like gold, silver, and platinum from the waste materials using exit bath, so very acidic. And then eventually, there would be open burning because open burning is the best way to get rid of your electronic waste, reducing the volume into ashes and then you flush them into the waterways. Not very good practice though. Um, so all these toxic chemicals are generated in the, in the water, in the air, when, if, you, if you have open burning, and especially if you try to, to heat the cables in order to extract copper from inside, the copper will serve as a catalyst. So you generate even higher concentration of dioxin. These workers, uh, without the knowledge, they, will, they are risking their, their life. So all these chemicals generated in the air and um, the place would act as a transformer, toxic transformers, transforming into certain chemicals. We have difficulty in analyzing them. Even our German partner who has a wide range of analytical equipment, they find it difficult. So uh, in terms of Tai Zhao, uh, th this is another different story because Tai Zhao, they, they are uh, recycling a lot of transformers, so PCB seems to be a problem in addition to all those toxic chemicals we, we talk about. So in Hong Kong, we also work on this wide range of toxic chemicals in the soil in one of our, our um, projects and, we, and then we found out there seems to be quite a bit of toxic chemicals compare with the, uh, the data generated from, from Tai Zhao and also uh, Guai Yu. So all these toxic chemicals are in the soil. They eventually uh, emitted through the storage and also some primitive uh, techniques for recycling and then eventually we compare the data with the Dutch guidelines and um, we found out quite a bit of soil, uh, well some former uh, farm soil are contaminated exceeding all these um, regulations and then we were interviewed on the TV and 
uh, two, two years ago. Um, now, in addition to our um, research, which, which was started in 2003 in Guayu and, and Taichau, so throughout the years we have been uh, publishing quite a bit of papers, about 70 uh, of all these papers. So not only our group, but there are other groups in southern part of China, uh, na namely the the Institute of Geochemistry in Guangzhou. They're doing very nice work. And uh, we found out there seems to be a lot of adverse effects on the environment and also human health. So these are, are the summary of all these toxic chemicals, uh, all these uh, effects, ecological risk and also human health risk, uh, sort of summarized here. Now the site I'm going to give you a bit of uh, a bit more details is the Guai Yu site, which has transformed from a small fishing village to a mega electronic waste recycling site. So the soil and and air are extremely toxic. So this is one bioassay test, and we use bioassay test uh, and also a a battery of living organisms for testing cell lines, also algae and crustacean, fish and so on. And we found out they are extremely toxic. So we look at human samples. We collected samples, uh, human samples from the hospital and we tried to work on the uh, chemicals. So no need to say it. These samples contain extremely high concentration of all these toxic chemicals. And then throughout the uh, survey of food consumption, and we found out the dietary intake of these people by, uh, by doing a food basket analysis. And then eventually we found out uh, those two sites, uh, affected site com compared with the bottom one, the uh, control site, those, living or, uh, those food items collected locally uh, especially fish, freshwater fish, tend to contain very high concentration of all these toxic chemicals. And in this particular slide, uh, I try to show you PBDE, flame retardant. So if you look at the estimated daily intake and also the effects on adults and infants and, and these adults, uh, workers as well as residents, and also infants, if the infants are fed with uh, mother's milk, they are under very high risk. So cellular damage and health impa impacts also carried out by other people. There will, there will be DNA damage, gene expression, thyroid function will be affected, lung function is also affected, and also reproductive health, and then growth and development, and even mental health. So throughout the years, we have well, not only our group, but other groups in the world tend to generate a lot of this evidence. So we also collected information, some epidemiological data from the hospital, and we found out only three years data though, but we can obviously see abrupt rises of certain uh, diseases. A, digestive system, B, malignant tumor, C, cardiovascular system, and D, respiratory system. So uh, we, we need to deal with these problems. Uh, we are hoping that the same mistakes will not be made in Hong Kong and also other countries. So we need, uh, we need update uh, e-waste regulation and policies, and we need soil protection and, reme and remediation the lessons we learned from China dealing with all these toxic chemicals and also the activities generate this, uh, these toxic chemicals. So we have amendment to the waste disposal ordinance in Hong Kong and then try to implement producer responsibility scheme on the uh, waste. And we have a joint venture nowadays in Hong Kong with a German company called ALBRBA, Elba, integrated solution. Uh, we have a uh, recycling ex activity built uh, inside the eco park in Hong Kong. 
And we try to look at the soil protection and remediation guideline, and we don't seem to be very satisfied with the, um, gu the guidelines uh, which are stipulated by the local EPD. So we need to work a bit further on that. Uh, in terms of soil remediation, I think we have quite a bit of lessons learned from, from China in dealing with this problem. For example, they have done a nice job in, in Taizhou, try to use bio remediation, phytomicrobial remediation, and using wetland for detoxification. So um, in Guayu, this the area has been cleaned up quite a bit. Um, and then uh, they have, in this area, Circular Economy Industrial Park, established in 2012. Uh, one of my colleagues, Professor Ann, is working on this. And then eventually, the uh, area has been clean, cleaned up nicely by the local uh, government. Now, this is a slide I, I like to show you. Uh, there are a group of people trying to monitor, monitor what happened throughout the years. Uh, when the regulations uh, are getting tighter, there seems to be improvement in terms of emission of these toxic chemicals, uh, PCDD, uh, PCDF, which are dioxin and furan, PCB, and also uh, PBDE, flame, flame retardant. So, suggestion for Hong Kong, I think we need to digitize our, uh, our soil cleaning up the contaminated sites, learning from China, and then we perhaps produce biochar uh, using, using food and food process, processing waste, try to avoid all this contamination of our food. Uh, so conclusion, I think there seems to be uh, enough evidence of environmental and human uh, impacts because of the uncontrolled e-waste recycling, which is extensive and severe. I, I think if you show the government, there seems to be adverse effects on, on human health and also economic loss, the policymakers will then become more alert. Um, there seems to be long-term effects on human health. We, we still do not know much. Uh, regulations should be fully enforced. It's no, no good to have regulation and yet you don't enforce them fully. Um, we need to have cost-effective control on the emission of this PTS. And we should have effective remediation techniques. Uh, we, we, we should remediate the uh, problem sites. Um, the adverse effects may be prevented in Hong Kong, uh, but we, it can be only solved via national and international co collaboration. I'm sure um, this would be the same for other countries nowadays receiving this electronic waste because China now has very tight control. So, uh, I, so I think I, I need to stop now. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wong. Please give him another round of big applause. Yeah. Because of time limit, we're going to skip question and answer session. So if you have any questions after the plenary session, you can ask him individually, please. OK, let me introduce second speaker for plenary session. Second speaker is Nanti Bolan. Uh, he is a professor of environmental chemistry at the uh, University of Newcastle, and he's a global center of environmental remediation uh, leader. And he's also a globally highly cited researcher from Web of Science, and he's a fellow of American Society of Agronomy. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Nanti Bolan. Good morning. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank the <coughs> organizers for inviting me to give this presentation. Thank you very much. The title of my presentation is PFAS, Beyond Defense. Um, this is the outline of my presentation. What are PFAS? 
the sources of PFAS input, the dynamics of PFAS compounds, that's the interaction with soil, the exposure and toxicity of PFAS compounds, the remediation of PFAS compounds, and some conclusions. Now, what are PFAS? Now, PFAS are pair and polyfluorinated alkyl substances. They are aliphatic substances containing carbon atom on which the hydrogen is replaced by fluorine atom. So basically, they are carbon-fluorine bonded material. And carbon-fluorine bond is the strongest bond in organic chemistry, one of the most strongest. Therefore, these chemicals are resistant to heat, water, and oil. So they are flame retardant, what Professor Ming Wang just explained to you. PFAS are used extensively in firefighting foam, non-stick cookways, food wrappers, and also carpet and fabrics and medical application and also plastic manufacture. It's very widely used to resist fire. Now PFAS includes both polymers and non-polymers. There are five groups of PFAS. I'm not going to go in detail, but the important one are there are two of them are very important. We call them PFOS, P-F-O-A. There are more than 2,000 PFOS chemicals, but these two are the most important one, which I'll be talking. So that is about PFAS. They are flame retardant chemicals. What are the sources of PFAS? There are many sources of PFAS. This gives the sources of PFAS, input to soil and groundwater. But the most important one are four of them. Firefighting foam, which is extensively used. Landfill leachate, biosolid, and recycled water. These are the four important sources of PFAS getting into soil and groundwater. Just to give you an example, this is in Australia. More than 90 sites are investigated for PFAS contamination because the soil and groundwater PFAS concentration is exceeding. There are a lot of concern about that. Now these sites include airport, defense site, fire brigade, training grounds. These sites use aqueous firefighting foam that is full of PFAS. So that's the main source of PFAS. Just to give you one more example, this is in Korea. There have been a number of studies on PFAS in soil and groundwater in Korea. So there are some cases where the concentration is exceeding the guidelines. Since 2013, Korea has implemented the monitoring of PFAS compounds, those two important PFAS compounds. Now it is becoming a restricted material for use under Persistent Organic Pollutant Control Act. So under this act, PFOS, which is the very toxic one, is restricted use, except where you can use under Stockholm Convention. So Korea is very strict with the use of this chemical. Same in the case of Australia, where I come from. So it is an issue, but majority come from firefighting foam. However, PFAS also 
comes from landfill leachate because FIFAS is used in kitchenware, carpet, clothes, everywhere. So this gives the concentration of PFAS compounds in many countries, including Australia. So you can see the concentration is exceeding the guidelines value. So landfill leachate is also an important diffuse source of PFAS. In addition to that, PFAS also end up in wastewater treatment plant. Again, PFAS is extensively used. So conventional sewage treatment plants are not efficient in the removal of PFAS. So PFAS has been detected both in the influent and the effluent in wastewater treatment plant. So majority of the PFAS end up in biosolid, which we call sewage sludge. Luckily, Korea doesn't use sewage sludge. Australia, we put biosolid into the soil. So biosolid is a major source of PFAS. So this is the guidelines for PFAS limit in biosolid. According to that, if we use German limit, 25% of the Australian biosolid cannot be utilized. If we use UK limit, Brian, you are pretty strict with the limit, so we cannot use 44% of the Australian biosolid. So biosolid is an important source of PFAS. So you all must be wondering what is this picture over there? That is dung beetle in Australia. Professor Ming Wang is very familiar with this. This is a very popular dung beetle insect in Australia. Very valuable beetle. But it will incorporate the dung with the soil. So we talked about what are PFAS, what are the sources? The main source is firefighting foam, which is used in defense. In addition to that, we get it from landfill leachate and wastewater treatment plant. Most of the compliance so far has been defense. But you get the PFAS in other sources. That is why my title was PFAS beyond defense. You cannot defend PFAS, it's a toxic material. But it also comes beyond PFAS. Now let us look at the dynamics. When I say dynamics, it is the interaction of PFAS with soil and groundwater. PFAS interact with soil a number of reactions. The most important one is R, adsorption, leaching, redox reactions, degradation, plant uptake. PFAS is very resistant to heat. Therefore, volatilization is very, very limited. Let us go into some of these reactions because we have been doing some work. PFAS interaction with soil, adsorption is the main process by which PFAS interact with soil. It includes both hydrophobic interaction with soil organic matter because PFAS is an organic chemical. Also electrostatic interaction with clay minerals because PFAS produces anions. So anions are attracted to positive charge. The adsorption increases with increasing length of PFAS compound. As the carbon chain increases, the adsorption increases. So we have been doing some work with PFAS. So what we did is we took the control soil, which is the, then we added nine organic matter at one level of carbon. Then we monitored the adsorption of both these two compounds, PFAS. PFOA. So number one, P 
PFAS adsorption is more than PFIA because it increases with decreasing solubility and hydrophobicity. The red one is for P4, much higher adsorption. Number two, adsorption of PFAS, both of the compounds, increases with the addition of organic matter. So when you add organic matter, the adsorption increases because PFAS is organic compound, hydrophobic, likes organic matter. We added same amount of organic matter. So there is some difference between these organic matters. The reason being, they contain different dissolved organic matter. So these organic amendments include all the way from biosolid to fish manure. So with the increasing dissolved organic carbon, there is a decrease in adsorption. So the difference between this organic matter on PFAS adsorption is because they have different dissolved organic matter. Because we added same amount of carbon. So we were expecting the adsorption will be same. It will increase but the same, but because they contain different dissolved organic matter. So that's number one. Number two, we look at the adsorption using three kinds of soil. Kaolinitic, smectitic, allophanic soils. We measure adsorption of P4, which is very high adsorption, using both the soil and also we remove the organic matter from the soil. So the black bar are organic matter removed soil. So adsorption followed allophanic soil, smectite soil, kaolinated soil, which is attributed to difference in clay mineralogy and organic matter content. Allophanic soil contain much higher organic matter and allophanic high surface area. Adsorption decreased after the removal of organic matter. So the moment you remove organic matter, adsorption decreases because PFAS is bound more to organic matter. However, allophanic soil, which is the last one, adsorbs much higher, slightly higher compared to other two clays because allophanic has higher surface area. So in addition to that, for the same soil, we look at the desorption. PFAS is relatively soluble in water. Therefore, it reaches the groundwater, especially in soil containing low adsorption capacity. That is the main issue. PFAS get into the groundwater, so when you drink the groundwater, you get toxic effect. So the PFAS desorption followed opposite to adsorption, less in allophanic soil, because allophanic soil retain a lot of PFAS. Also, desorption increased with the removal of organic matter. Adsorption decreased with the removal of organic matter, Desorption increase with the removal of organic matter. So therefore, it says PFAS adsorbed onto organic matter is less likely to be dissolved. Look at the plant uptake. PFAS can be taken up by plant. So the PFAS uptake is PFOA is more compared to PFOS just opposite to adsorption. So the more you adsorb, less you uptake. Now that gives, this is high organic matter soil, low organic matter soil. In low organic matter soil, you take more uptake. Transfer factor is the ratio between plant and soil. So higher the bar, higher the uptake. So therefore, PFAS uptake increases with decreasing organic matter. So when you have organic matter, that, the adsorption is much less. So organic matter can bind PFAS and reduce uptake. 
This is a very interesting one because PFAS is attracted to high protein tissue. Most of the organic pesticides are attracted to lipid. PFAS is one compound which is attracted to protein. Now this is the work done by our university team. They are looking at hemp seed. This is a very novel research. Hemp is industrial hemp, cannabis, not, not marijuana. This is the industrial hemp. It contains 31% protein. So what they are doing is mixing the hemp seed with the groundwater. So it binds the PFAS, then you filter that. So you remove PFAS. This is a very new area of research using protein to bind PFAS. But the problem is, when PFAS getting into our system, it binds with the protein. So that's the toxicity. So you can use the protein to remove the PFAS, but when it gets into human, it binds with the protein. Degradation of PFAS, as I told you, PFAS is very resistant to temperature, heat. That's the reason they produce PFAS, because they can control heat, fire. PFAS degradation includes abiotic and biotic. Abiotic degradation includes thermal, chemical, and photodegradation process. Most of the PFAS compounds are very resistant or recalcitrant to biodegradation by naturally occurring microorganism. I don't think biodegradation is a pathway for PFAS because they are very resistant to degradation. So we talked about what are PFAS, sources of PFAS, mainly from flame retardant and also landfill leachate and also from wastewater treatment. We look at the dynamics of PFAS mainly through adsorption, mainly by soil organic matter. That when you have a lot of soil organic matter, PFAS can be absorbed, less available for leaching, less available for plant uptake. Now let us look at the exposure and toxicity. The major pathway of human exposure of PFAS include drinking contaminated water. That's what's happening in Australia. Majority of the groundwater are contaminated with PFAS. Ingesting food contaminated with PFAS, mainly fish and shellfish eating food packaged in material containing PFAS. I know there are a lot of students here. You love pizza, you love popcorn. The boxes you are getting is PFAS coated. So every time you eat pizza, please be careful. In addition to that, hand to mouth transfer also contribute to PFAS uptake. And also workers associated with PFAS industries are exposed to a higher level of PFAS, what we call occupational exposure. The International Agency for Research on Cancer has classified one of the PFAS compound as group 2B carcinogen, possibly carcinogenic human. You are all very familiar with these two people. One is Erin Brockovich, other one is Julia Roberts, she acted in one of the movies called Erin Brockovich, Chromium Toxicity. So the Australian public brought Erin Brockovich to talk about PFAS. PFAS typically associated with the liver, protein, and bloodstream in human, 
with your half life of two to nine years. So that's why it is a persistent chemical. There are a lot of concern in Australia about PFAS. PFAS has been used for the last 20, 30 years. It is not a new chemical, but it is an emerging contaminants of concern. So I say emerging, not an emerging contaminant, it's an emerging contaminants of concern because we have been using for a long. Because humans are exposed to different PFAS sources, as I explained to you, it is difficult to determine the level of exposure from these sources. It's very difficult to finger, fingerprint. Now this is the blood concentration from various countries with the time, PFAS compounds in the blood. The good thing is these surveys indicate PFAS levels on blood are dropping due to the reduced use of PFAS. So people are using less and less PFAS. Therefore, the concentration in the blood is going down. That's a good thing. But the bad thing is, every one of us is having blood in PFAS in our blood. 100% of the human population. Because PFAS is everywhere. The cloth we are wearing, the carpet, Professor Ming Wang is happily on the chair, that also contain PFAS. PFAS is used to control heat, heat resistance. So PFAS is used everywhere. It's omnipresent, like God. It's everywhere. Not a good God. So we all have PFAS in our blood. We cannot escape. So we talked about sources, it is everywhere. Dynamics, soil organic matter is the main important. Exposure, drinking water, and also ingestion of food. Now let us briefly look at remediation. There are three approaches to remediation. Destruction, filtration, and immobilization. Destruction, soil, waste, like biosolid, groundwater. It involves oxidation, electrochemical, reduction, zero valent material, defluorination, thermal decomposition, paralysis. Paralysis used to produce biochar, as Professor Ming Wang just explained to you. Filtration. It's mainly for groundwater, nanofiltration, reverse osmosis. Both of them are very expensive. That's the problem. The most common one is immobilization. Again, soil, waste like biosolid, groundwater. You can use activated carbon, anion exchange because PFAS occurs as an anion. So it is attracted to positive charge. This is the one of the material from our team called Matt K. Professor Ravi Naidu's team. Hemp seed, I just explained to you. So immobilization is the most common technique. But in immobilization, you cannot remove the chemical. You can make it less bioavailable as Professor Ming Wang just explained to you. This is the technique we use for heavy metal very commonly. So you add some chemicals to immobilize. But we need an integrated approach. Not one solution can be applicable. So it can be infil nanofiltration followed by immobilization or oxidation or reduction our reduction. So finally, some conclusions. The sources, point source is firefighting foam, which is used in defense. Diffuse sources, biosolid, recycled water, landfill leachate. 
So that's why my title was PFAS Beyond Defense. It is not just in defense. Soil interaction, adsorption through both hydrophobic partition and electrostatic interaction. Adsorption component, both clay mineral and organic matter. Organic matter is much more important because it's an organic chemical. Desorption, PFAS adsorption increases with increasing organic matter, but desorption decreases with increasing organic matter. So organic matter is very good in keeping PFAS non-leachable, non-bioavailable. Exposure pathways, drinking water, and ingestion of PFAS containing food. Toxicity, group 2B carcinogen, but luckily PFAS levels in people's blood are dropping due to the reduced use of PFAS in commercial product. Remediation, mainly through immobilization, filtration in soil and groundwater. Finally, what is the take-home message? There are two take-home messages. PFAS contamination occurs beyond defense site, resulting from landfill leachate, biosolid, and recycled water. So people always ask, why you have a title PFAS beyond defense? Two reasons. One is you cannot, def you cannot blame only the defense. It occurs beyond defense site. Number two is, it's a very toxic chemical. You cannot defend it. So PR, PFAS beyond defense. Remediation of PFAS contaminated soil and groundwater remain a major challenge. Australia is putting a lot of funding on research on PFAS. So if some of our Korean students wants to come and do PhD in Australia, please come and do PhD with us. I'm stealing your student. <laughs> I just want to thank my past and present students who contributed to this research. Once again, Thank you for inviting me to give this presentation. It's a great honor to come and give this presentation. Thank you.